60 um, bucks a piece, that's re very reasonable. Yes, it used to be tractor supply carrier, do it best in Fort Wayne, doesn't carry it, Bose doesn't carry it, none of these places do. But uh, we're able to track them down a lot, get some of those, their old cylinder stock tank heaters, and they work perfect. We've used them for years. Ms. Brown uh, used them for years, and it you know, warmed that water right up. It's like a sauna in there. I was like, I don't want to get in here. Uh, but uh, uh, let's see, so uh, glad for them, praise the Lord for them. And then uh, we need 11 more to hit 5,000. 11 more to hit 5,000. So uh, I'm going to set a goal to have uh, some myself. So I hope uh, the Lord puts me in my path because I'll be looking for them. Come on. Uh, not just baptisms, but set up salvation. Hey. Get uh, hey. But salvation is, you know, getting people saved hey. and bring them to be used to be used to do it all. And get somebody saved on Monday, bring them to church the same day, get them baptized on uh, Tuesday. I mean, I remember. Catch you in the morning church. Well, it's Thursday at <laughs> four o'clock in the afternoon when people are at church getting baptized. Like, what in the world is happening here? Uh, man, God will do great things with people who are looking. Uh, and that's what I'm looking for. I told a Sunday school class this morning, I said, uh, uh, I want to know Mrs. Brown. I want to hurt her, hurt her. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, hey, uh, Luke, get those uh, flowers that are right there. Take those to Mrs. Brown in the back, please. Thank you, Luke. Uh, I told the Sunday school class this morning, I said, uh, uh, I'm going to start preaching Curtis Hudson and Tom Malone and Lee Robertson and Jack Isles and old Doug Jackson sermons. I'm going to start preaching those sermons. I said, a couple reasons. Because, number one, truth is worth repeating. And then, two, two, because... Uh, they are from the greatest gen. They were they lived in the heyday of independent fundamental Baptist churches, right. and um, uh, I'm not saying that it's going to, that we're going to have a heyday in independent fundamental Baptist churches again, but we can have a heyday around here. Yes, sir. Um, and uh, so I want to preach the messages and have the same spirit. So I said uh, I want to dress like Doug Jackson, dress like Jack Hollis, dress not the, their powers not in their tie or another Isles Stacy Adams. And it's not in uh, uh, the, their cologne. It's in who they talk with, who they walk with, and that's the Lord. So if we talk with the Lord and walk with the Lord, we can have a heyday around here again. My, um, my, one of the reasons 
why I don't want the Lord to come back today, and I do. I do want the Lord to come back today. But one reason why I can take the opposite side and say don't come back again is because, number one, there are more people to be saved. There are more people to be saved. As soon as the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, millions of people, just like we're going to ascend, the whole, whole mess of them are going to descend. Uh, every, every, every car accident, every calamity that happens during the rapture, millions of people are going to die and go to hell. So we have to remember that. But the other reason is because I want my kids and I want Alex and Crystal and Ernesto and their kids and I want some of them. I want the young people to I want the young people to shout and the old people to weep. I want the people to see it done again. Uh, I have a book by uh, Dr. Sheldon Smith. He is the editor of The Sword of the Lord. And it's just a, it's a book entitled Do It Again, Lord. Do it again, Lord. Just like Elisha said, Lord, give me a double portion of what you gave me Elijah. I'm, Lord, I, just give me what Elijah had. Just give me some of that. Uh, and uh, I, I want people to experience that. I, I want Brother Paul Ozzie to walk out of Sunday school shaking. Because there was 120 kids. Mrs. Paul Ozzie walk out going, mm -hmm. <laughs> walk out like, like a brand. I want Carrie and Arif to experience what you've experienced in the past. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Baptized by fire. Uh, so that's what we want. We want to have them do it again. Uh, so uh, I'm going to find those baptisms. We're going to hit that number, uh, 5,000 this year. We're going to hit it. Uh, just uh, the announcements in, in the, in the uh, bulletin today are uh, school-related uh, and patch club. Patch club. Uh, this coming Wednesday, they'll be singing for us uh, in the uh, Wednesday Bible study. And then Academy Workday, that's the 15th. Uh, August 28th, Academy Open House. And then August 29th is the first day of school. Be in prayer also for Brother Joe Roll, who's recovering. Had that heart, uh, that uh, pacemaker put in. He's doing okay, but he's got recovery. You know, he's like, I can see Mike. I'm like, Brother, you are just starting on the tracks. He's like, I texted me last night. I wanted to be in church tomorrow, but the doctor said, I'm not a brother. You had a pacemaker put in. Pace yourself with your pacemaker. And, uh, but he, he, uh, he wants to be here, wants to be in church. And uh, I appreciate Brother Joe Gold. Um, the silent, sturdy type. But I love Brother Joe Gold. I love Mrs. Inga. She is not the silent type. Uh, Mrs. Inga. If you're watching Mrs. Inga, we love you. And uh, so be in prayer for these folks uh, with uh, just ongoing health issues. Ongoing health issues. Uh, the mission field, Brother J.P. Landian, Don Burke in Australia, uh, and many others. Bruce Brother Eddie Gallagher, Marvin Winner Ventura, Chris Lifford, Lenny DeYoung, Doug Jackson, Jake Jackson. Keep all those folks and their families in your prayers. Okay. Uh, oh, man, we just missed it. It's okay. Uh, Steve and Cindy Jewel, are 55 years of marriage on the 5th. Wow. So Friday, that's, wow, 55 years. And then Pastor and Mrs. Jackson, 40 years. 40 years, four decades. Uh, uh, let's see, that'll be Tuesday. Congratulations to both of them, or condolences, whichever one suits your, whichever your persuasion is. Uh, but, uh, okay, let's see. Academy Workday, group students, first through 12th grade, when Monday, August 15th. What? What's going on? Every student in first through uh, 12th grade, which I don't believe we have any of those, will be required to attend the Academy Workday as we prepare the building for upcoming school year. Uh, we hope to instill a sense of belonging and passion uh, for knowledge uh, as the students have organized, plan, and create their learning environment. Lunch is provided. Everyone is welcome to lend a hand. Let Sarah Hoffman know if you plan to attend so she can adequately prepare for lunch. I will say this. Uh, we, yeah, how many, how many acres was it in Monroeville that we had? Three? Three. Three. About three acres. We didn't have, we rarely had, and when we did have, we very rarely used the riding one. Uh, and it wasn't be zero turn, get the lawn done in 30 minutes type thing. It was, here's a push mower, and most of the time it was Jamal and, 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 and I that would do it. Uh, sometimes we bait tra uh, Travis or Frankie or Mike, oh, hey guys, you want to come over here? Yeah, come over. Cool, because we got a lot of stuff to do. Uh, but uh, the work would be done, you know, and that would always, we'd have, have, the house was kind of, it was a little different. There was a, a front patio off to the left side of the house. And we'd go out there and we'd stand, and by the time we were done working, usually the sun was setting. And uh, we'd rake it all, too. I mean, we'd cut it, and we'd rake it, and Dad would wait for it to get long enough to cut so we could give it to the horses. And I hate this. 
Hey, Dennis. Hey, Reverend Al here. Took this away from Lakeside Park. We um, play basketball all the time. We had our friends that are, hey, living out here. There's nothing to do out here besides work, work, work. Hated it. But we'd sit out there, and our go to was uh, lunch meat sandwiches, potato chips, lemonade, or coke, you know. And uh, that was the go to meal still to this day. It's like, you guys want lunch meat sandwiches? Yeah. And not like lunch meat, like, but like the deli, deli meat, real cut stuff, good stuff. And uh, I'm going to start the labor on the cheese bread type for the uh, All right, folks, let's go. Time to eat. Uh, but uh, we'd sit out there and he'd say, and uh, we'd go on our ride. We'd tell us to do. Now, granted, Sarah and Jessica would help. But we, Jamal and I did the brunt of everything out there. Um, I remember, what, how many? 198 tons? 156. 100, 156 tons of dirt, 156 tons of gravel. That's what it seemed like. And Dad said, OK, Jay, OK, Jamal. He was like, here's a one wheel wheelbarrow and two shovels and three acres. Go, you know where I told you to put it. Now I know Jamal hasn't been around lately. <laughs> uh, uh, go, go to work. And we'd sit back, you know, when the day was done, and he'd say, now look at what you did. Don't you feel proud? No, I feel proud. Feel beat. Feel tired. I don't like this. But as a man, I will tell you, as a grown man, there is something inside of you where you can't look at your work and go, I am proud of what I did. It's a biblical teaching. Solomon said, man, you labor. At least enjoy your labor. Look what you've done and enjoy what you do. You know, and a lot of people are stuck in jobs that they don't like doing because they never found their, their niche. They never found their leg. They never found their, their calling. And they're stuck in miserable day in jobs. And I, I, I felt that and many times resentful about the CDL. My dad always told me, Jake, it'll pay off one day. You watch and see if God didn't lead us down the path for you to get the CDL. And it's worked. I've driven a bus, I drove a bus, and I've been able to provide for my family with the same okay. Drive base, a uh, truck isn't my dream job, but providing for my family is what I want to do. Amen. And I'll do anything necessary. So there's a bank I'm getting after church who's with me. Uh, I'll, do anything, <laughs> I'll do anything necessary to provide for my family. Uh, right now, Jamie's looting everyone's cars as we speak. Uh, <laughs> I'll do anything and everything necessary to provide for my family. But so, kids, when you set up your classroom, when you get your desk right, when you get the classroom set up right, it's also a teaching and work ethic to where you look around and you see what you've done. And you say, I did that. I did that. And uh, at, at school, it's something that we want to teach is man, taking ownership of your work. Uh, and taking ownership and being proud of what you do and what you uh, go to Oklahoma Science and Things of Law. Indiana has just become the most anti abortion state in all of the Union. Uh, we are, it's, it's more difficult to get an abortion in Indiana than any other state. Um, along with some other things. But he, he used, he said a phrase, he said, I, you know, he wanted to just give you thanks to all the people who were working on the, the agenda. And he said, with seriousness of purpose. Seriousness of purpose. And that just resonated. Seriousness of purpose. And then I heard a Navy guy say this week, he said, uh, will you rise to the occasion? And that right there, man, that just, those, those words challenge me. I like things that challenge me. I told Jenny last night, I said, you know what's missing? You know what's missing from me? And she looked and she's like, yeah, a lot. Uh, she said, no. she said <laughs> I said, you know what's missing? She's like, no, I said, competition. I need something that, that I drive at. What I do have, it's things the devil. And there is another one, it's called the old nature. If I wake up, if you wake up every day, and, and maybe competition is not your thing, but competition is something that I may rise to the occasion. Things are falling apart. Will you, will you rise to the occasion to stop them from falling apart? Rise to the occasion. And I know that sometimes your hand, you feel like your hands are tied. Uh, but what I'm going to talk about tonight, I hope we'll address that. What I'll preach and teach about tonight, we'll address about having too little. Uh, but um, uh, I appreciate what everybody does around here. I appreciate all the work that people put in, uh, and that people that are uh, that have been, that have put in, that are putting in, and that will put in. And it's appreciated, and it's for His glory. So keep at, it. keep at. It. But Kevin, let's have our second song. Third song. Third. Please turn your hymnal to number 349. Number 349. 
the comforter has come. First thing I did for the first. Okay, Wednesday I felt okay. 
And then today I feel, I feel okay. Yesterday I didn't feel too bad. Uh, after the funeral, I went home and took some more stuff. I slept, I did a lot of sleeping, trying to just escape this. Uh, but, uh, so I feel better, uh, but I'm still a little bit congested. But I know that, uh, it's always, preaching is a cure-all. I mean, it truly is. I come in here with headaches and stomach aches and back aches and heart aches and everything in between. Uh, should that right off of shoulder surgery, I had that on Thursday and I was preaching on Wednesday and or I was preaching on Sunday. Um, in, a, in a polo, no doubt. I think I ought to kind of do that again, have this one repaired so I can match that polo. Uh, but um, preaching in a polo, and, uh, uh, but man, once you get going, once you start talking about something that you're passionate about, you, 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 you kind of forget for a minute about your pain. And you, you kind of forget about it and you maybe commiserate or empathize with others who are going through some things. And you're trying to encourage others. And what they say one of the greatest medicines uh, uh, for yourself is trying to treat others. And if you'll treat others through the word of God, through something that you're passionate about, whether it's singing or preaching, you forget for a little bit. And so I know that tonight, um, the congestion I really won't get in the way. Uh, because I've been taking my medicine and, and we're meeting tonight in the name of Jesus. Uh, John chapter 6, John chapter 6, what we're going to do is, is I'm going to tell you, of course, this is Christ feeding of the 5,000, verses 6 through 13. We're just going to chop through those tonight. Verses 1, excuse me, chapter 6 of the, the Gospel of John, verses 1 through 13. We're just going to go through those tonight, and I'm going to uh, preach to you and speak to you about when a little becomes a lot. When a little becomes a lot. Heavenly Father, uh, you can look down right now and see each and every single one of us, and you know that uh, together we can do a lot. We can do much. But on our own, we may be offer only a little. Lord, help that mind, the, the mindset of a little, or the, the fact of only having a little, a little ever to sideline us. And we're going to say, well, I don't have enough, so I can't do anything. But we can still do something. And we sing that song, little as much when God is in. Heavenly Father, we are just a, a little church, but we're a lot when you're in it. Heavenly Father, I ask that you get in it. And as uh, brothers, Brother Sheldon Smith says, Lord, do it again. Do it again, Lord. Lord, you know what I'm asking you to do again. And I think everybody in this room could take a, a, a good guess of what we're asking for you to do again. Lord, I'd ask that you do it. Lord, I'm not asking to be a popular church. We're not asking to be a popular church. We're a rich church. We're just asking to be a church that has the presence of God in it. Where people get saved, where people get right people come to know Jesus. I like popularity, I like riches, but Lord, we want you first. Meet with us, Lord. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now it seems, um, it seems that in life, that life runs on a highway of highs and lows. Highs and lows. And it seems that, or, or, or you've often heard mountaintops and valleys. Mountaintops and valleys. Uh, we face valleys, we face uh, mountains, and sometimes it seems that we're not able to go on. It seems that we say we can't take one more step, that we can't go any farther. Now, our obstacles, whatever they may be, uh, we can we can attach uh, all kinds of uh, uh, different adjectives to it, different identifiers to whatever obstacle it may be. It may look totally overwhelming. Um, there are things that I've experienced lately, uh, as you have, uh, where you have exhausted all your possibilities. You've been praying. You've been asking. You've been searching. You've been asking for counsel. You've been in and out, back and forth. You've been doing everything, losing sleep, tossing and turning. And you, you, you have your faith in God. You've placed your faith in God. But you also know the principle of draw nigh to God, you draw nigh to you. Do all that you can do, and God will meet you there. Uh, 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 and, and you filled up, the, you filled up uh, uh, the throne of grace with every prayer you could imagine praying. Maybe you prayed and said, "Maybe I'm not praying it right, Lord. Maybe I'm not doing it right. Maybe I'm not saying it right. Maybe uh, there's a sin in the way." So you confess your sins and you do 
all these things and you think, well, let me just get this out of the way. And you do anything and everything that you can to, to get over these, this, this overwhelming obstacle. And sometimes there's just nothing more you can do. Now, in our eyes, this happens. Here's the general tendency. The general, ten the general tendency is just to quit. The general tendency is to throw in the towel or to have a contingency plan. I can tell you right now, I have a, a contingency plan. Now, I believe what I have ventured out to do has been the call, has been what God has called me to do. Uh, uh, and I, I don't mean a pastor, I'm not second guessing that. I know God called me a pastor, I'm not saying, but here I go, oh, you second guess what God wants me to do. Of course there are. When you start getting in uncharted waters, you're unfamiliar, right? You're unfamiliar with the landscape. You're unfamiliar with the surroundings. You don't know what kind of lively beasts are in that water around you. But if God has called you out to it, oh. what do we say? He'll bring you through it. Amen. He'll bring you through it. Now, that's what we attend to do. Now, there are several different ventures that I have in my lap right now. One is a pastor. Another one is a family man. Another one is a, a small business owner. Uh, another, there are other uh, ones on the back burner that I can see out that maybe I'll dive into one day. But I don't want to go to them. Like Moses said, Lord, if you're not going with me, I don't want to go. Lord, if you don't go with me, I don't want to go. But what we do is we give a tendency to throw in the towel, to give up. And really, if God has called you to do something, you're not just giving up. You're giving up on God. You're not just throwing in the towel. You're throwing in the towel on God. Amen. Now that scripture verse that says um, uh, that if God be for us, who can be against us? That doesn't mean that God is on the sideline with his pom-poms cheering for you. Oh. In its translation, it means that God is in your stead. He took my place on Calvary. Why would he not take my place in life? He took my place with sin, having bore the sins of the world, the sins of Jake Jackson. Why would not he take my place with any other obstacle that I had in life? Why wouldn't he do that? I believe that he would. I believe that he would. So when it says that God be for us, God is in the ring for me. God's in the ring. He's fighting battles for me. God is fighting for me. Not that I'm on the sideline doing nothing. It's a, it's a battle royale. It's a tag team situation. But when God's in the ring and I feel like, well, He's not throwing the punches the way that I think. He's drawing this out. He's, God can go in there and knock this dude out flat in round one, one second on the clock. God can knock this whole situation out, and we can move on to the next match. When, when God sometimes gets in a boxing match for us, God gets in a fight for us, and it goes one round, and two rounds, and three rounds, and four rounds. Sometimes it looks like our situation is up against the ropes, and what we're going to do is we're going to say, we are throwing in the towel. Really, we're throwing in the towel on God. Though the, the, the cross before me, the world behind me, though none go with me, still I will follow. That's the mindset. A mindset of reckless abandonment of faith. Of faith. And sometimes our faith is shaken. And that's what, when our faith is shaken, we have a tendency to quit, to give up, and to throw in the towel. But what happens is, is we forget who God is. God is like, I don't know, um, undefeated. We just sing a, a, a song. Um, uh, may I introduce to you, basically it's called the champion of the world. Champion of the world. Um, uh, he's undefeated. All time undefeated, undisputed champion of the world. God is. And we forget who God is. God is the creator of everything there is. He's the Bible says the master. He's the master. The master of what? Everything there is. He's the owner. Owner of what? Everything there is. The Bible says that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The Bible says he's the lily of the valley. He's the bright and morning star. Now, folks, he is the one who was, who is, and the one who is to come. He's still God yesterday, today, and forever. And we need to remember, remember that as an actual fact. Not just go, well, it sounds good. It's just like one of these little, it's like a dream catcher. I hold in my car somewhere, or I put it above my bed, or what? No, he's much more than that. 
He's much more than that. Now, these verses, verses 1 through 13 of the 5,000. Uh, um, absolutely, 100% impossible. Impossible in the eyes of men. But God. Amen. If you were here this morning. Absolutely, 100% impossible. But God, when you put God into the equation, what needs more to be said? Uh, when you put God into the equation, it's just an, it, what looks impossible becomes an opportunity. What looks impossible becomes an opportunity. And that opportunity is to display his awesome, incredible power. This week I read about Elijah and how Elijah uh, uh, went to uh, King Ahab, who, actually it was a servant, Ahab's servant, or not Ahab's servant, Elijah's servant went to King Ahab and said, hey, Elijah's in town because there's been this big old drought, you know, and they've been looking for this dude. Most wanted, Elijah, everybody's looking for him. And uh, Ahab's got 400 prophets, these false prophets, you know, and he says, man, put you, all right, look, you guys call out to your God, and I'll call out to my God. And then Elijah was talking smack. If you'll read this guy, it's awesome. He says, um, he says to these guys, he's like, you guys build an altar and get your, get your, get your sacrifice. I'll build an altar and get my sacrifice. And then you guys call on your God. So from morning until noon, they cried and they wept. The Bible says they whipped themselves. They cut themselves. The Bible says until blood gushed out, calling unto their God. And Elijah's sitting over there whittling a stick, drinking some lemonade, going, maybe he's on vacation. Maybe he is on a long journey, he says. Maybe he sleepeth. <laughs> he said, you, you guys call to your God. Go ahead and call to your God. He said, I'll give you all the time you need. So, man, these guys are dying, calling out to their God. No answer. Elijah says, okay, my turn. Uh, hey, all you guys, go get, a bunch of, go get a bunch of vessels. Go get all the pots and pans you can. And I want you to... Dig a, dig a trench around my, my altar, and they filled it with water to the bread. And they said, now I want you to soak the altar with water. And it soaked up the water. It so, uh, soaked the, the altar. And they said, I want you to soak the sacrifice to water. I want that thing to be dripping wet. And they soaked it. And then he prayed a prayer and called out to God Almighty. He said, God, show these fools what you can do. Showtime. And the Bible says that the fire rained down from heaven and licked up all of the water. All of the stones, all of the altar, all of the, where it was, there's nothing left. There were no bones, there were no ashes. It says the fire was so hot, it licked up every single drop. Let's go, buddy. Yeah, right? And all these guys, whoa, whoa. And then they said they turned and you know, they turned to God. They turned to God. Now, folks, God doesn't have to send down fire from heaven today for people to turn, from, to, turn to God. The, uh, the, the poor man, the beggar and Lazarus, or, La uh, or Lazarus and the rich man, and the, and the rich man went to hell. And he said, uh, Father Abraham, having lifted up his eyes and seeing Father Abraham and Lazarus in his bosom. And he said, Father Abraham, you know, send somebody to tell my brothers. Uh -huh. And Abraham said, they have Moses in the law. And he said, yeah, but, but if you send somebody back from the dead, if you send Lazarus from the dead, if you send somebody from the dead. And Abraham said, if they're not going to listen to Abraham and the law, then they're not going to listen to somebody come back from the dead. Because somebody coming back from the dead is more powerful than the words of God. The Bible says that the words of God will last from generation to generation to generation to generation. You can every have you can have every Adolf Hitler and every Stalin and every Communist Party and every Socialist Party and every Liberal Party and every Progressive Party try to wipe out the Word of God. You can't. Right. You can't. Right. It'll be here forever. Amen. Forever. Why? Because it's established in heaven, and it is heaven that established. Earth. Yeah, man. The God that established heaven is the same God that established earth. And the, the point that I'm getting at is, is or the point that I'm getting to right now is the same God that did that for Elijah and the same God that was um, uh, uh, there in the Old Testament and did all kinds of incredible miracles and had all that power then is the same God that has it today. And you'll find that when we read through, um, uh, the first 13 verses here that the same God that empowered Elijah showed himself through our Savior, Jesus Christ, through this miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. Now, when we go to God and give him our impossibilities and say, dear God, we know you can use this as an opportunity to display your power. It used to be 
my agenda for the, the for Free Rivers Baptist Church to emerge again was to wiggle my fingers in my ears and my at our opponents and say, all you naysayers. It used to be, God, do it again so we can say, man, that boo boo, all that boo. <laughs> to all them punks, all them chumps who left here going, uh, uh, who had sour grapes for Three Rivers. They used to be, oh, we love Three Rivers, and now they're a bunch of turncoat. I'll, I'll stop there because I'm not, I don't want to stir up that 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 soot that's lying at the bottom of the heart of Jake Jackson. Right. I don't want to stir that up. Right. I let I let grace bury that stuff. Come on. Uh, so right. I don't want to go unleashing that the beast again. That's right. But what I've done is I've grown in grace, right. and the grace isn't Lord make Three Rivers Baptist what it used to be, so we can so we can uh, uh, basically show our enemies that they were wrong. No, it's not Lord. Do what you did at Three Rivers Baptist Church again so the next generation can see how great you are. So more people can be saved. So more people can be baptized. So more buses can run again. So the place can drive again. So people can turn and look to the skies and say, God is real and there is a God in heaven. And he does do what he said he does. And the young people shout the old people weep because they see God do what he said he would in his book. That's what it's about, God. Now, there's the flesh still lies in me and says, yeah, and you still get to stick it to the naysayers. Um, that's just the flesh. But let God get the victory. Let God, listen, I like David. David was like, Lord, cut off the heads of them that hate thee. Lord, I am for them. And if people are against me because I'm for you, kill them. David was like, I'm hardcore. And I'm like, yeah, I like David. I'm, I'm after David. Jacob, man, after David's own heart. Uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, but I, I like that. I'm like, yeah, stick it to the enemy. But I want to make sure God gets the glory. His power and our impossibilities are an opportunity for him to showcase his ability to overcome any and every situation without exception. Just like anybody can be saved without ex uh, exception. Anybody can if you say, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and I want him to save me, I want him to forgive me of my sins. For him that cometh to Christ, he will no wise cast out. Yeah. Where sin did about grace did much yeah. more about it. Yeah. But when it comes to you only having a little, and you big old impossibilities in your life, the Bible says, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro about the whole earth, seeking to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are perfect towards him. You say, ah, oh, there's that word, you're doing that perfect word. It doesn't mean perfect, like without a stake. It means mature enough to trust him. Mature enough to, to look to him and not to your riches. Jeremiah 9, 23 says, Oh, uh, uh, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, nor the rich man glory in his riches, nor the mighty man glory in his might, but let him that glory is glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, saith the Lord. I delight in loving kindness, righteousness, and judgment in the earth. God delights in those things. And when we delight in those things, and we desire, we desire to glory and know if I can walk around, I, not as much as some other people, but I can walk around and people think I'm mental. I should be in an institution for saying, I know God. Yeah. Many denominations teaches that the pastor knows God, the reverend, the father, the priest, the pope knows God. But you little sheep out there, you can't know God. I know God for you. Yeah. And God will speak to me through the week, yeah. and I will speak to you. Yeah. That's a bunch of bull. Amen. Hello. You can know God just as much as the pastor. You can know God just as much as you want to. Let him that glory, glory in the next. It doesn't say let the pastor glory. It said let him, and that's her is also accepted. Let the person that glory, not glory in how much they can bench press, not glory in how much money they have. I see these boxers and all these Instagram people and all these athletes and all these rappers carrying around bundles of money. You fool! That's not going to buy your soul. Come on. What will a man give in exchange for his soul? You're going to die and stand before God. You're going to go, here's all my bundles of money. God says, I don't want your stinking money. I don't want that. The only thing that gets you into heaven is having the blood of Jesus Christ covering your sins. Well, how do we get that? It's too late. Once you're dead, it's too late. Once you die, and you will die, it's too late. Every man, I, listen, when I got this clock right here, I might as well have an invisible one on my wrist right now, ticking down the last breaths and how many heartbeats I have, how many days I have left, because it's ticking down. It's ticking down, and you're going to die. You're going to die, and the worms are going to eat you. 
Well, we, now we have formaldehyde, and it, it preserves the body. Whatever, you're going to be a corpse in a grave, six feet down, in a box, and people ain't going to visit you no more. You best know where you're going when you take your last breath. Amen. Get serious about what life is about. Amen. Life is about dying. Amen. Scary. Life is about dying. Set your house in order. Life is about dying. Set your eternity in order. Good day. We're not scared to die. Well, you're not if you're saved, amen. amen. Not if you're saved, you're a born-again Christian. You're not even scared. Amen. And I'm not scared. I'm not scared to die. Look, you know, we're talking about the other day. He's like, we're talking about the rapture and death. He's like, I think I'd like to die. I said, well, I can arrange that. I said, uh, he said, uh, you know, I, I think I'd like to experience what it is to die. I think, well, I want to go on rapture. I want to go on rapture. I don't know if there'll be much difference because some people are driving down the road right now, boom, hit by a truck, they're out in eternity. And they're going, wait, that's it? That's my life? That's all that's left? That's, I had too much I was doing. I had places I was going. I was going to my daughter's wedding. I was going to my son's wedding. I was going on vacation. My wife and I were just getting away for the first time in umpteen years, and I had to all the debts were paid, and we're free, and we're just getting out to go into life and start living for ourselves, and that's it. That's all that's left. Yeah, that's it. That's all that's left, and now you face your eternity. Yeah, man. For the Christian, there was a man who was taking a hold. He was walking around the mall, and he asked an older generation, and he said, what do you think was a, a young, a black fella asked an older uh, white gentleman, and he said, uh, sir, what do you think is wrong with America? And a, a gentleman asked, and he said, uh, we've lost our, our morals. And he said, well, what do you mean by we lost our morals? He said, we've lost our, our Christian standards. He said, I believe that Jesus Christ died and paid for our sins. Hey, hey. He said, and that's what he, and he said, oh, he, and the young man replied, he said, oh, so you think we, we're not as religious? And he said, no, it's got nothing to do with religion. It's got everything to do with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. If you put your faith in him and trust him, you can know him. And thousands of people have seen that video. That, that man didn't have a track, he didn't have a Bible, but right there, right there, on the spot, on the moment, in an interview, he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and he'll save you just as you are, just right where you are, right you. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So just little old you can do something for God. Little old you who has only a little bit of experience, who has only a little bit of knowledge, who has only a little bit of talent, can do something for God, like Pastor Jackson said today. And if you got, what is in thy hand? What is in thy hand? Use it for the Lord. What is in thy hand? I'm sick and tired of people who got talent, treasure, and, 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 and time, and they don't do jack squat with Jesus Christ. Amen. And then they want to sit around and complain about the work church doesn't have or what it doesn't offer. Well, if you get off your blessed assurance, you blessed bum, the church will be able to do something for Christ. The church doesn't run on fairy dust. The church doesn't run on pennies. The church doesn't. We, we, make, we make it work, though. Thank God the people are, are, are Thank God for the ones who are faithful in their time, talent, and treasure, and giving. Because I think God takes that little and he, and he meets the needs. Could you, imagine, could you imagine the abundance if everybody tithed? Could you imagine the abundance if everybody gave an offering? Could you imagine? Could you imagine? If everybody gave some time and gave some talent and gave some treasure, I, I, I can't stand it. I've been, I, there were some years ago, I said, man, I need help with this project. And I was like lobbying to a couple of guys who knew how to do that stuff. Hands behind their back. I would stand up here and say, listen, if you see a problem, would you address it? And then I, I, can, I can repay you. I can do anything. I did everything besides go up and fall on my knees and say, would you please help me with this? I, I'm not, well, listen. I've said this, and this is where it dawned on me. I will not be the Holy Spirit for people. You know what? The Holy Spirit sees the problem too. And the Holy Spirit knows what kind of optic it gives. The Holy Spirit knows what kind of look it gives, what kind of vibe it gives. The Lord's not for disarray. The Lord's not for brokenness. The Lord's not for dirtiness. And if, if, Lord, if you're not going to touch the hearts of these men who know how, then you're going to have to give me the ability. And I don't know how you're going to do that. Or put somebody in the way who can do that. Why in the world does the church have to go out and hire heathens to do the work that Christian men and women can do? Why does the church have to spend its time and offering hiring companies who support abortion? Companies who are going to pay their employees who are going to go out drinking and smoking and fighting and clubbing and going to strip bars. Why does the church have to give its money that the members gave to to hire individuals who don't know Jesus Christ 
to do the work. The work that church members could do. Amen. The work that the pastor could do. Okay. Hey man, let's, let's hire within. But at the same time, let's not hire within if the laborer is not worthy of being hired. Amen. We all think, well, it's a Christian brethren. Yeah, but the Christian brethren do shoddy work. That's why we have to hire people. Yeah. The Christian brethren don't bat their eyes and crawl. The, the Christian brethren say, well, it's the church. I can get away with paying me now and I'll work later and never show up to do the job. The church has little, and I don't mean our church only, but the church of Christ has little. Right. Because it's misappropriated, because it's misused, because it's wasted, because it's right. thrown away, because it's not it's not given to faithfully. Yes, sir. Now good I like stuff, Jay. now I like That's good stuff, man. I'm trying to get to my message. <laughs> my message is as little as much when God is in it. Amen. And God has used the little that this church has. The little that this church has, and God has made it go further than we even expected to go. Uh, it's gone so far that Jamie and I are getting ready to take a crew. No, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, right. Down the uh, Maumee. Down the Maumee. A cruise down Lombard Street. Yeah, down the Maumee. Yeah, a cruise down the Maumee. <laughs> <laughs> amen, amen, amen. And but by the way, I'm not getting, I don't want to walk Listen, I'm not a pastor that's ever done it. I, I don't believe I'll ever. I won't ever do this in the context of poor mouthing. I will express a need. I will say, folks, the church needs. I expressed one, and somebody came to speak and said, and I said, if you want to take it off a tithe, however you want to say, now we'll use it as an offering. Pray the Lord. Great. That's great. We'll get some music. They, they, they did some work for their grand, their grandmother the other day. They got five bucks a piece, and I told them this morning, make sure you tithe. By the way, give an offering to each of you. Give a buck. Give it up. Give it up. Give it up. Well, fit me. Look at I, I told Houston to tell Lucas and I who heard Lucas in the room. No, only 50 cents. And I walked in there and said, No, boy, you're giving 50 cents as an offering, too. You are doing it. I'm telling you that you are doing it, or I'll take all of your money. Uh, uh, anyway, Dad, don't doubt me. I'm just, I'm teasing. I know you didn't know. He just walked in and said, Dad said, I, I heard. I was just using you as an example. You're easy pickings. Uh, my kids are easy pickings. And one day, one, listen, one day I'll be sitting on you, and one of you guys will be picking on me. I'm sure you will. But it's okay, bro. Uh, what, what is it? I brought into this world. I can take them out, right? Uh, <laughs> it's yeah. It's, it's all love. It's all love. All right, all right. So here we have here we have an overwhelming situation. You have listen. The Bible says five thousand men beside many children. Let's say every let's say every man, just for the sake of numbers and paying it out, every man had a, a, a wife and one child. Not not every man did, but some men had three children. One guy had two wives. One guy had <laughs> yeah. so you had five thousand men beside women and children that straggled. But think, let's just say there were fifteen thousand. Let's take away all the women and children. You had five thousand people. 5,000 men. The Bible says he feeds the 5,000. Now, you have an overwhelming situation. We've had that before. Remember Thanksgiving uh, uh, baskets that we give away? We have 150 baskets out there, 200 families. And we're like, oh no. It's becoming overwhelming. You, you, you go out on your bus route and you have, um, you know, uh, uh, 60 that say they're coming from Saturday and, and then you don't know it, but this one house brought an extra three and this extra house, their cousin stayed at night and that's an extra 12. And then you're like, holy cow, what's going on? And before you know it, you have 85 on the bus and you don't have enough donuts. You don't have enough milk. You don't have enough. By the way, milk on buses is a bad idea. Uh, you know, it's hot, it's sticky, it's a right amen. You can testify. Y'all, uh, it, 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 it doesn't make sense. Milk on buses. Uh, but um, uh, 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 you don't have enough stuff. Oh no! What's what's happening? It's becoming overwhelming. We're splitting the donuts. We're going. Where's Jesus to give us more donuts and milk when we need it? Amen. Uh, but it's overwhelming situation. Now let's let's read it very quickly. The Bible says after these things Jesus went over to see Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles which he did on them, which were diseased. And Jesus went up into the mountains where he sat with his disciples, and the Passover of the feast of the Jews was nigh. 
And when Jesus lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he said unto Philip, When shall we buy the bed and these may eat that these may eat? And uh, this he said to prove him. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. Uh, I'll touch on each and every. Well, I don't know that I'll do every verse, but several of these verses. For he himself knew what he would do. Hey, hey, why right there? Let's stop. Hey, Philip, where are we going to get the money to buy food for these people? Jesus knew Philip didn't know. Jesus knew. It says he, he asked him that to prove him because Jesus knew what he was going to do. You know what's happening? God knows what he's going to do in your life. God knows, God knows what he's doing in your life. God knows, and here I am at a, at a wall, so to speak, at an impossible wall. And I'm looking at going, oh, no. God goes, oh. If our life is all free course, where does God get to interject himself? Yeah. If everything is blessing and nothing is trial, everything's not blessing. Right. Blessings are recognizable and miracles are recognizable when there's a need for them. Yeah. When there's a need. Uh, one fellow said to me, he said, usually, he's like, I got a bad thing about spending money. He's like, but I think I have a good principle on it. He's like, I try to spend all the money that I have on the needs and, and, and the wants of my life so I have empty pockets for God to fill back up again. He said, brother, you live that way all you want, but I ain't doing that. Uh, put some in your shoebox, amen. Put some in the safe. Put some in my sock. I'm not, mm -hmm, I'm not spending all my money. God, I trust you, but Mr. Benjamin's got some pull down here. Uh, you know, <laughs> but, uh, 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 that, that type of living where it's a reckless abandonment for the Lord. Why? Because D Jesus said right here, I, I, I asked Philip, where are we going to get the money to buy the bread? To prove him. I wanted to see where Philip's faith was because I knew what I was going to do. This is what Philip says. And Philip answered him, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them. Thousands of dollars worth of bread is not sufficient. This wouldn't feed the people. Um, uh, that every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said unto him, There is a lad here with, with, uh, which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes. But what are these among so many? Hey, Andrew, if it wasn't worth bringing up, why'd you bring it up? If it's not enough, why'd you even say anything? Here's, hey, here's, hey, everybody hungry? I have, everybody in here hungry? It's time for dinner. I have food. Beef jerky stick. <laughs> Everybody want a bite? Take a bite? Yeah, I know you want a bite. You know what this would do? Nothing for your hunger. If you were starving and you were going to die in 10 days and you took a bite of this, you might last one half more day. But, but hey, hey, everybody's hungry? Here's a guy with a piece of beef jerky, but what is that about so many? But why would you even say anything? You just take that thing and be like, everybody else hungry, I'm gonna slip off over to the corner and have myself a meal. <laughs> he didn't do that. Andrew was probably like, Lord, we, us disciples, we could probably make this work for us. But how are we gonna do that with these people? Here's what let's keep let's keep going. <laughs> Verse 10, Jesus answered, make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so uh, men sat down in number about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples took them that were set down, and likewise also the fishes as much as they would. Man, that means they ate till they were full. And when they were filled, uh, uh, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, and nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together and filled the twelve baskets with fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten little as much when God is in it. Yeah. Here you have an overwhelming, an overwhelming situation in your life. Jesus knows about the circumstances. Gee, I came in here and prayed very boldly last week. Quite boldly. Boldly enough to say, Lord, I think that was too bold. And then uh, I walked out home um, and, and said, Lord, I, Lord, I've acted foolish. I have not acted in, I, I, I have acted in faith, but I have not proceeded in my mind in faith. Lord, I know you're making a way. I know you're making a way. I don't, I know your works, but I don't understand your ways, Lord. God knows your circumstances. He knows what you face at this very moment. 
Jesus also knew how he was going to handle this situation. He already knew it. He said he knew what he was going to do. You think Andrew was the first one to spot the boy with the five loaves and two fishes? No, I think Jesus saw him first. Jesus saw him first. Now, before the situation even materialized and came together, Jesus already knew what he was going to do. Folks, God has the answer to your question in life tonight. At this very moment, God has it in hand. Before you even ask the question, God already has the answer. So your overwhelming situation, God has the answer. God has it. But in verse 6, we find this. It's, it's, a, a, it's a request for faith. All of people, verse, uh, verse number 6 is, and he, said it, uh, and he said this to prove him. He said this to prove him. You know, sometimes God's calling you out to do things to prove you. To prove you. I, I know that maybe what I'm going through lately, and some folks are, uh, uh, they, they know just the, the, the situations uh, of everything that I have on my plate, and maybe what's on your plate. But uh, I said some months ago, man, I, I don't have a lot going for me, but man, I just got this, I got this undying, unrelenting, uh, 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 built on the rock type of faith. Well, guess what started happening? The earth started shaking. The wind started blowing. The waves started crashing. The sun refused to shine. The clouds covered it. The fog got really thick. And I went, do I have this unshakable and quenching and dying faith? I don't know if I'm standing out on the beach by myself. I feel scared. But when I run into the high tower that is my God, I don't feel so scared. Amen. You see, when you call, I, this, I hate to say it this way, but really it is. It's calling God out on his word. Yeah. Saying, God, you said, if I will, then you will. When you're doing it, Lord, when you're doing it, he'll do it in his time. He'll do it in his time. Just don't you let go. All of God's people are supposed to live by faith. The Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please him. Our typical response, though, as Christians who face these overwhelming odds and overwhelming possibilities, is we become faithless. Faithless. And faithlessness says that God is dead. Faithlessness says that God isn't able, or that he is able, but he won't for me. Folks, the Bible says that he gave his only begotten son for you. Why would he withhold anything else? Why would he withhold? He gave Jesus. Why would he withhold anything else? So you have a, 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 a situation that you have to recognize. What is it tonight? What is your overwhelming situation? Well, God has a request from you. He requests that you remain faithful. So don't respond with the flesh. Don't respond in the flesh. I can't. We can't. They can't. I can't. I can't. The attitude of I can't has never seen skyscrapers built. Right. The attitude of I can't has never crossed an ocean. The attitude of I can't never built a church, never built a family, never changed a life, never had a relationship, never did anything. The attitude of I can't. It's never been done that way before. And, well, you know, maybe we just shouldn't uh, go down that way. We're better safe staying in the spot that we are. Faith says that we can move mountains. Philip's response is centered around money. He said, Lord, we don't have enough money. We don't have enough money. Andrew's response was similar, but it's centered around what couldn't be done. He said, there's food, but it can't feed these people. Right. There's food, but it can't feed these people. We say that today. Here we have this church, but this church can't reach four way. Come on, Jay. We have this church, but it, it, it can't do it. Here I am, just a, a, a pastor who's just trying, who's just trying to get my bearings. And listen, I'm not getting my bearings. I know what I believe. I know why I believe. And I know what I'm pressing on. But I'm a youthful preacher. I've got a lot of lessons to learn. And I'm trying. Amen. I'm trying. And I say, this message isn't good. You know, this, 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 this message could be sneaking. Find its way out of a paper bag. <laughs> Miss Jennifer, you know, I, I said there yesterday, Miss Jennifer, she's given her, she's given her heart and her fingers and her feet for the Lord. Amen. To play the piano. And she stumbles over a key here and there. And then um, uh, Joe Miller Jr., who is so uh, so fucked on the piano, gets up there and just he can do it. Coughing and sneezing all over himself, you know? And I, I think Miss Jennifer sits there and listens intently. I think she listens. I think she goes, man, I wish I could play like that. 
I listen to preachers and go, man, I wish I could preach like that. And, and, and uh, uh, people look at each other and go, I wish I looked like that. And I wish I spoke that way. I wish I had that talent. I wish I had that ability. I wish I had that. And you think you're this big and God won't do anything for you. You think you're this big and God can't do anything for you. You think you're this big and God won't ever use you in any capacity. But if you just say, hey, we sing that song. Lord, here's my voice take it. Here's my feet take it. Here's my hands take it. Here's my talent take it. Here's my treasure take it. Lord, just, here's my life. Let it be consecrated to thee. Lord, do something with me, and God will do something with it. God will do something with it. If you give your life to God, God will take that little, and he'll make it much. The question from Jesus to Philip and to Andrew is, how are we going to handle this? Philip says, we don't have enough money. Andrew says, we have just literally not enough food to feed all of us disciples. Not enough to feed big people. You know, this wouldn't feed Peter, you know. And of course, Andrew, Simon, uh, Simon Peter's brother, he had to be throwing out some jokes at Peter. Uh, 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 but here are four responses. Here are four responses to what they said we should do about the problem. Number one, let's get rid of the problem. Let's get rid of the problem. Here's the problem, let's get rid of it. Number two, let's raise more money for the problem. Number three, we have a little, and it will never be enough for the problem. What do we do about the problem? Well, let's just avoid it all together. Let's just skip it, get over it. Well, let's raise more money to, to, to uh, 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 confront it. Number three, we have a little, but it's not enough to get the job done. And number four is the right one. Let's let Jesus have it. What do we do with the problem? Let Jesus have it. First Peter 5, 7, casting all your care upon him because he cares for you. Folks, don't listen to anything the flesh has to say about any situation going on in your life. You know what the flesh is? You know what the flesh is? The flesh is a liar. The flesh is a liar. Here I am laying in bed, and I'm getting ready to wake up, and I'm like, oh, I don't want to get up. My flesh is saying, you're tired, stay in bed. My spirit's like, no, get up. Amen. My flesh says, you can't go on. My spirit says, yes, you can. I say, no, you can't. Yes, I can. The world, the flesh, and the devil. The world, the flesh, and the devil. We say it's big. I said this morning, I said it all on say, we, We're all duped into thinking that the big three evils are big government, big food, and big pharma. Big pharmaceuticals. When truly, truly, it's big world, big flesh, big devil. If we'll get that, we'll be able to, you know what, we can handle big food, big foot, big, big, we can handle these fools down here. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Not against flesh and blood, but against the prince of the power of darkness, amen. That's who we wrestle against. And uh, uh, so let's get rid of the problem. Let's just avoid it. Number two, let's raise more money for the problem. And I, I, I'm for that. If they had the money, okay, great. But why spend the money when you have Jesus? Why not address the problem if you have Jesus? We have a little, but it will never be enough. Well, then don't ever sing the song, Little as Much When God Is In It. Don't ever sing that if that's your, if that's your attitude toward addressing the problem. But the fourth answer was the best answer. Let's let Jesus have it. Right. Let's, let Jesus have your marriage. Let Jesus have your children. Let Jesus have your finances. Let Jesus have your church membership. Let Jesus have your talent. Let Jesus have it. Let Jesus have you. Why are you not your, you are not your own. You've been bought with a price. Therefore, will glorify God in your memory. So when any of those thoughts come along, and anybody ever comes along, Anything of the flesh or any, or, or, or any obstacle come, comes along and say, you can't do it, you can't do it, you can't do it. The flesh is a liar. If, you're in, if you are in it and God has led you to it, God has a purpose for you in it. Let's go. God has a purpose for you in it. Amen. Like I said again, uh, 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 that phrase, seriousness of purpose. Now, I'm, I, I, I'll try to finish the rest next week. Romans 8, 28 says, uh, And we know all things work together for good to them who are called, the call, according to his purpose. Now, God's way to handle the impossible is found in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. The Bible says, Be careful for nothing. And it doesn't mean be reckless. It means don't be so full of care about everything else. Be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You see, God isn't looking for excuses. 
you ever, you ever say that to somebody that, 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 please excuse me, they say, there's no excuse for you. I say, I didn't say excuse me, I said excuse me. I'm not looking for excuses. Listen, it, there's something in me, there's a mindset in me that if God is for me, if I have God on my side, I'm not looking for excuses of why it can't be done. I'm looking for excuses of why isn't it being done? Why is it not being done? I've got God. I have God. I've got the comforter of his tongue in my heart, and I've got his word. Right? If we have that, then why isn't it being done? Here's the reason why. There may not be one particular thing. Stop listening. There may not be one particular reason, but I always search, is it me standing in the way? Am I doing something that's hindering? Am I doing something? Lord, I keep my sins confessed. I try to walk upright. I try to have integrity and be morally correct and right. And I'm standing and without fault. Not that I'm a perfect person, but Lord, if I fall, I get back up. Lord, I'm adhering to your word. You're not asking me to be perfect. You're just asking me to walk with you. Amen. And if I'm trying to do that, and you're trying to do that. God's not looking for excuses of why it can't be done. He isn't looking for self-doubters. He isn't looking for question marks. What God, what is God looking for in your life? I'll tell you. I won't have an invitation. But this is what God's looking for. God's looking for you to have faith. And you can say, well, I've had faith. Good, have it till you die. But what if it doesn't turn out the way that I thought it should turn out? Are you God? Right. Do you know the future? Do you know? Do you know what's on the other side? You don't. Everybody here, we are. And, 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 well, I don't like that terminology. I don't care. I'm glad to be a part of it. I am a pawn on God's chessboard. Right. And so are you. You're not the rook. You're not the the. Uh, some of you are the queens. You're not the queen. You're not the king. You're not the bishop. You're a pawn. And I'm glad to be a pawn on God's chessboard than a king on the chessboard of life. I'll do that all day. Every day. I'll take that all day. And by the way, well, pawns are for sacrificing, but pawns are part of the strategy. And we know Romans 8, 28, that all things work together for good to them that are called according to his purpose. Amen. And I know I've chopped that out. But it all works together for good. What good? His good. His glory. And when we all get to heaven, we receive our crowns of life. We're going to take our crowns and throw them at the feet of Jesus anyway. Everything that I get in heaven is because of him anyway. Everything that I receive in heaven is because of him anyway. All the good works that I produce through salvation here is because of him anyway. So in all glory, in all majesty, in all honor, and all power given back to him. The Bible says that when the name of Jesus Christ is called, that every knee in heaven, and every knee on earth, and every knee in the earth will bow at the name of Jesus and say, King of kings and Lord of lords. One day Satan himself is going to say, King of kings and Lord of lords. Muhammad is going to say, King of kings and Lord of lords. Buddha is going to say, King of kings and Lord of lords. Joseph Smith is going to say, King of kings and Lord of lords. Hitler is going to say, King of kings and Lord of lords. Stalin is going to say, King of kings and Lord of lords. Pope Pac is going to say, King of kings and Lord of lords. One day Nancy stinking drunk Pelosi is going to say, King of kings and Lord of lords. Hey, Joseph Biden is going to say, Is going to bow me and say, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Yeah. What's the difference between all of them? They fall in one two categories. They're either saved or they're lost. Amen. If they're saved, they can say, King of Kings. Amen. Lord of Lords. Amen. Brother. Father. Amen. Or they can bow to me and say, King of Kings. King of Kings. Lord of Lords. And judge. Oh. And they will be judged oh. for their life. Yeah. I'm glad I will be judged for my life right. on the merit of you know, on getting to heaven. Right. I, get to he I get to go to heaven on the merit of Jesus. Amen. How cool is that? Hey, man. You ever stand in line, and I'm not even close. You ever stand in line somewhere, and somebody says, oh, they're with me. Or you have that free pass, and you walk up front, and everybody's in line. You got that free pass, and you walk in like, man, heaven isn't beautiful. You standing in front of the pearly gates, and Peter's got 20 questions to ask. Hey, Peter had to get in. I know how to. Well, how did he get in? Because he was an apostle? No, he got in because he believed on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ.
Christ as his only begotten son, uh, as his only begotten uh, uh, Savior, as the only begotten Son of God. For whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Uh, 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 you cannot come to the Father. No man can come to the Father but by me. I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus said. Not Muhammad, not good works, not the church, not a hymn, not, a, not a hymn book, not a, uh, how much scripture you memorize, how many roles you have, how many prayers and deeds you have, how many times you went to church, how many vacation Bible schools you live in, how many scriptures you memorize. No, it's not by like that. Because the thief on the cross was nailed. He, he was nailed to the cross. He couldn't get down and confess. He was nailed. To, to the cross. He couldn't get down and give you good works. He was nailed to the cross. He couldn't get down and get baptized. He was nailed to the cross. He couldn't go do a bunch of good works. He was nailed to the cross. Or to the cross. What did he do? He looked to Jesus. He looked to Jesus. The author and finisher of our faith. And did you know you may be, you may be nailed to your cross tonight? You may be nailed to your situations and your circumstances tonight. But I'll tell you this right now. Look to Jesus the author and finisher of your faith. All God is looking for is faith. Do you have faith? Do you have faith? If you have faith in his son, Jesus Christ, God says, you're in my family. I know you. But if you deny my son, then I deny you. I deny you. Oh, no. What's God looking for in the ones who had faith enough to trust him for eternal life? For that same kind of faith through everything else you're going through. That same saving thing. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? I want to ask you tonight. I want to ask you tonight. If you say, I die, if I die right now, if I die right at this very moment, if I had a heart attack or some incredible mishap or tragedy, if I happen to if I happen to die tonight, I know, I know that I would die and go to heaven. I know that because I believe on Jesus Christ as my Savior. If you know that, would you raise your hand and say, I know that I'm saved. I know that I am. I know that I am. Okay, put your hands. You put your hands down. Now, I'll, say, I'll ask you this. If you do not know, if you have any doubts whatsoever, whatsoever, any doubt, you've been, you've been battling it, fighting it for some time, you say, I do not know, but I want to know for sure. I want to know for sure, 100% sure tonight, what God says about how to get to heaven. Is there anybody in the room that would show me your head and say, I, want, I don't know for sure. I'm 99.9% .9 sure. But I want to be 100. Is there anybody you would raise your hand and say, I don't know. Anybody? You don't know? Okay. We'll come talk to you. Okay? I mean, I definitely after coming to this church, I want you to be the first to die. Well, I'll, I'll talk to you when we're done. All right? You come forward and we'll talk. All right? The most important thing you know is going for sure that you go to heaven and die. Okay, you know that. Everybody can raise your hand. What next? What's next? Knowing for sure that God has your back. Man, if you're just a, you're a mumbling, fumbling, bumbling, stumbling, crumbling Christian, but you're trying. Amen. You're a Christian who falls down, man. You are about the most goober Christian there is. You're about the most uncoordinated, <laughs> consistent Christian there is. But you're trying. Let's go. God says, I see it. Can two walk together lest they be agreed? I'll help you look. God will walk with you. If you'll draw an eye to God, he'll draw an eye to you. Don't you lose your faith. Faith, faith till you die if you have to, but don't you lose your faith. Don't you lose your faith. You let God show himself strong in the, in the days, the weeks, the months, and the years to come. You just wait it out. You wait it out. Casting all your care upon him. Stop carrying your burdens. Lay them at the feet of Jesus. Heavenly Father, thank you for all that you've done. Give me wisdom moving forward. Help our church, Lord. We need you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We're dismissed. Uh, go ahead and come on up here.